Mashlom Ka Givrin. Oh, the new year, you've already forgotten. That's such a long time we've not been together. Mashlom Ka. Good. At least you said Tov. No one said Tov Me'od. Very good. I didn't hear any Ra out there saying bad. So uh, praise the Lord. You're doing well. Okay? Okay, let's take out, uh, first of all, your textbook and turn to page 127. I want to go over the Nifal that you have been reading about and uh, look at it a little bit more, and then we'll turn to exercise 20 and go through it. So page 127 in the textbook, talking about the Nifal conjugation. Uh, the Nifal conjugation of the, of the Hebrew verb is primarily a passive. Now, when we talk about such things as passive, middle, reflexive, and active, we're talking about what is known as the voice of the verb, the voice of the verb, the grammatical voice. Uh, when we talk about past, present, and future, that's grammatical tense. When we talk about uh, such things as uh, uh, imperative, uh, the subjunctive or the jussive, a cohortative, we're talking about the mood, the grammatical mood of the verb. But voice has to do with the relationship of the subject to the action. Voice defines the subject's relationship to the action in any particular sentence. So if it's an active verb, the subject is the actor. If it's an active verb, the subject is the actor. It's performing the action. If the verb is passive, the subject is the object of the action. It's still the subject. And so the verb agrees with it in number and gender. But it is also the recipient of the action. It is the object and so it is passive. It, in, the, in the passive sense, some other subject is the agent of the action. Uh, when you say, uh, I was given a gift, the giver is not yourself. Someone else is the giver, the agent of that gift. But you are the subject of that verb, I was given. And notice how we translate it with a form of the verb to be in order to show that passive context, uh, context and concept. If it's middle voice, the subject is both the actor and the recipient. I took care of myself. I drove myself to the restaurant. You're, uh, you're the actor and you are the object, you are the recipient, you're doing something to yourself. So that is the middle voice, the middle voice. Uh, excuse me, that is the uh, reflexive voice. I've got to get these two straight here. Reflexive voice is when you are the subject and the object. Then if you want to be involved in you're the subject, and you're the recipient, but the concept is more for your benefit or on your behalf, that is the middle. In other words, I uh, went to uh, exercise, or no, that wouldn't work at all. I, I, I took the exam for myself. That is a middle voice. I took the exam for myself. The for yourself, for oneself is the idea of benefit, is the idea of gain or advantage, and then that's the middle voice. The middle is you're doing something and you are the recipient in a sense, but you are doing it for your benefit. It's for yourself as opposed to doing it to yourself, which is the reflexive. Yes, Scott. So the reflexive and middle are separate components? They're separate components. And the fine distinction there between the two is if you're doing something where you have to translate for yourself or for himself or for themselves, then you're going to have to look at it as a middle. But if it's something done to themselves, uh, if they uh, beat themselves, if they hit themselves, that's reflexive, not middle. Okay? So that's what we mean by grammatical voice. Active, passive, reflexive, and middle. And the nifal 
is found in the final three primarily, but it sometimes is also active. If you read the textbook here, you found out that the uh, verb that's uh, lachem, uh, that has to do with uh, waging battle or going to war or fighting, is primarily found in the nifal stem or nifal conjugation. And it's not hardly ever found in the cal. And the nifal of, with the passive and middle and reflexive concept has kind of disappeared. And so it's translated as a mere active. When you say that a certain king fought against another king, obviously that is an active. He waged war against that king. The other king is the object of the action. Uh, the the uh, passive concept isn't there. He's not fighting himself. The uh, reflexive concept isn't there or excuse me, he isn't being fought is the passive and he isn't fighting himself is the reflexive and he's not fighting for himself necessarily. It could be by context, you have to gauge that by context, but that'd be the only other option normally when you have the nifal of lachem would be either fighting for himself or just fighting and so therefore it takes an active sense. So just because a verb is found in a certain conjugation does not mean it always will have the meaning of that conjugation that is normally found with the vast majority of those forms of the verb. You have to pay attention to the lexicon. When you look it up in the lexicon, uh, you'll have verbs, uh, for example, like naka, uh, nun, kaf, he, that uh, has the idea of to strike. And it is primarily found in a hyphial or hafal. It's a causative. And so the causative emphasis there is really missing because it's, I don't think it's ever found really in the cal. And so the hyphial and hafal have taken over the active forms. And the hyphial and hafal causative have become zero elements with regard to meaning. They're zero semantic elements. So just because it's in a certain form, doesn't mean you always translate it as causative, like for the hyphial and hafal, or as passive, middle, and reflexive for the nifal. You have to look at the lexicon, find out if it's used in a spread of different conjugations, so you know that each conjugation is evidently a particular meaning and is distinct one from another, or if it's only found in one particular category of conjugations, the causatives or the pl and pu'al we'll talk about later, or the nifal, or even the hithpael, you have to look at it to see whether or not it really has any meaning derived from that verb form itself, the conjugation itself. So when you're looking at the nifal, your first question is, can I translate it as a passive? Does context support a passive? where the subject is the recipient of the action rather than the actor and subject of that action. Okay, the recipient. And the agent is outside himself or herself or themselves. Look at that first. That's your first option. If the context does not seem to make sense by translating a passive, then test it as a reflexive, and then text, test it as a middle. If none of them seem to make sense, then translate it as a simple active, the same as you would translate the cal. And you can confirm that by checking the lexicon. Check the lexicon. Um, it'd be a good idea for you to think about uh, obtaining Holiday's lexicon. Uh, it'd be a good idea for you to start learning how to use a lexicon. During the course of this semester, we will have some exercises in lexicons. Uh, so we'll be looking at that and having assignments in that. And we'll learn how to use them and what to look for in them. And they're tremendous tools, tremendous tools. But remember, they're just tools. And tools are not always uh, fitting for every task. And sometimes a tool is designed by someone who did not take into account certain factors that would be involved in every particular use or every particular task that that tool would be set to. And so it might have flaws in its design. 
and in lexicons we have the difficulty of having primarily unbelievers producing them and in many cases uh, not just unbelievers but very liberal in their approach to the Word of God not really viewing it as the Word of God um, look at having humanistic standards and therefore in some cases you could turn out to be a better judge of the meaning of a word than the lexicon because you trust the context of its usage and you aren't bent upon trying to divide it into different editors and compositions in various time frames and so you're ready to accept it at face value as prima facie evidence and uh, in, in doing that you have a healthier and more holistic outlook on the text and you're, you will rely upon context to tell you where some of these lexicons will impose upon the text their concepts or ideas regardless of context. So learn to use them judiciously. And this goes for every tool, even a grammar. Hopefully you'll find our grammar is evangelical in its outlook and trusting the text and uh, looking at the text as having integrity and authenticity and therefore not devising a grammar whereby we make the text say what we want it to say. But we allow the text to speak for itself. Uh, that's our prayer, that's our hope that it does that. But always remember that any tool you use, whether it's a grammar or a lexicon or a concordance or a theological dictionary is humanly produced and being humanly produced those human beings are flawed by sin and commit error even if they are believers. <laughs> so you have to watch it and uh, don't accept it as being absolute authority. Uh, look at it as a an aid, a help to be used judiciously and carefully and sometimes you have to make the judgment as to whether or not the decision given in the lexicon or the grammar or the concordance or the uh, theological dictionary is really consistent with the text of scripture uh, itself. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll give examples of that as we go through. I'll show you uh, where you have to beware what type of things to watch out for. We'll discuss that in the days ahead. Would Question? Holiday, is he a liberal scholar? Yes. Holiday is a liberal scholar, unfortunately. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of amusing in a way because one of his greatest contributions is a study of the word shuv uh, in the Hebrew Bible, which, which uh, is sometimes in some context the, the concept of repentance. But he gives no evidence of having repented himself. It's uh, an amazing thing. So. And, and because of that, there are some blind spots in his approach to the text. Okay, Scott? Uh, regarding looking up words in the lexicon, um, we, we're looking for the stem and not like it's a nip out form. We wouldn't start with the new from the alphabetical perspective. No, uh, in the lexicon, you look under the root. And it'll have all the different. Right, and it'll list there the various stems. Okay. And we'll get to that later. But it's, lexicons are arranged by roots normally. Now there are some exceptions to that for Holiday and for the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament by Kohler and Baumgartner in that they list nouns by means of the prefixes of the nouns rather than under the roots of the nouns. So if you have a noun with a meme prefix, you look it up under meme. Not talking about like the min preposition, but actually the noun form having an, a meme on it. Uh, you look it up under that meme. Whereas in BDB, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, you had to, if you had a noun that began, began with a meme, you had to look it up under the three letter root. And so if you didn't know what the root was, you couldn't find it very easily. But Holiday and Kohler and Baumgartner changed that system to where you can look them up as they're spelled. But that has to do with nouns, not verbs. The verbs you have to look up under their three letter root. Okay? All right, on page 128, there's a brief, and this is very brief, identification discussion or identification chart to help you understand the various forms found in the NIFAL. And you can see those forms illustrated on page 129, there across the page, in the far right hand column. You can look at that and compare. On the perfect, you see there that the perfect, every single form of the perfect has a noon prefix with a hyric under it. 
And that is the primary characteristic. Besides the fact that all of these fit the pattern of the name Nifal, Niktalti. Notice that, Niktalti, Nifal, all right? Niktalta, Niktalt, Niktal, Niktala. There the pathic disappears because of the open and uh, accented syllable, the comet's hay on the end. Niktalnu, Niktaltem, Niktalten, and Niktalu, again a long open syllable and full letter vowel at the end, so the pathic disappears. There's only two forms. There are only two forms where the pathic is not present for the name Nifal. Okay? And that's in the third feminine singular. And it's in the third common plural where you have a full letter vowel as the suffix on that word. So the name Nifal fits every one of those. So you can recognize it just by knowing the name because of the way it's pronounced. No other form of the verb has that combination than the nifal perfect. Then in the imperfect, as you look at them, you see ekatel, tikatel, tikatel, or tikatli, yikatel, tikatel, nikatel, tikatlu, tikatalna, yikatlu, tikatalna. Notice that every one of those is ika, ika. And so every one of these has a hiric under the imperfect prefix. It has a doubling dogish in the first letter of the root, which is right after that prefix. And underneath that letter is a comments. The only difference is the first common singular where you have a segol under the prefix. But that's still in the I slash E class vowel uh, category. So that's what we call the nifal triangle. The hiric under the prefix the doubling dogish in the first letter of the root, which follows immediately after that prefix, and then the comets underneath that same letter. That's the Nifal triangle, and it exists in all imperfect forms. All imperfect forms. Then look down further at the imperative. Remember the imperative you form by taking the imperfect of the second persons and removing the imperfect prefix. In the nifal, you replace the prefix with an a uh, hey. So you have hikatel. Why the prefix? Why was the hey added? In order to retain the nifal triangle. You cannot preserve the nifal triangle unless you have something there to place over that hiric. You have to have a constant. But instead of using the noon, the he is used, but the nifal triangle is still present. So you have hikatel, hikatli, hikatlu, hikatalna. That's the imperative. The participle, notice, since this is a passive stem primarily, the participle is passive, and it's only passive. There is no such thing as an active participle in nifal. In fact, the cal is the only participle, the only conjugation where you can have two participles, an active participle and a passive participle. That occurs only in the cal. All the other conjugations have only one participle because those, those conjugations like the nifal are one voice primarily. They are passive, not active, or active, not passive, one or the other. So nick Niktal. Notice the pathak has changed to a comets. It's identical to the cal, or excuse me, the nifal perfect, third masculine singular, except the pathak has been heightened to a comets. That's the only distinction. If you go up and look at the perfect, third masculine singular of the nifal, niktal, you'll see the only difference between it and the participle is the comets instead of a pathak under the second root letter. And then the infinitive absolute still has a, a uh, nifal triangle in one form of it, but notice the key is the holum. Just as the holum was the key also in the cal infinitive absolute. Katol, katol in the cal. 
Here it is hikatol, or there's an alternate form, niktol. Now you'll recognize that niktol is identical to the cal imperfect first common plural. So that is a form that can have two separate parsings. And so how do you tell the difference? By context, remember that the infinitive absolute is normally found together with a form of that same root in the perfect or imperfect. Remember the PI uh, and PC, CIA twins? the cognate infinitive absolutes, most infinitive absolutes are found together with another form of the verb, back to back, with the infinitive absolute either being before or after, but both are from the same root, they're cognate in form. And so that's your first clue. If you have that cognate form in the perfect or imperfect right next to it, then you know that Nick Toll is the uh, infinitive absolute rather than a cal imperfect first common plural. So there will be identifications to help you and context will also help. And then the infinitive construct, hikateo is identical to the imperative masculine singular. Remember that same thing existed in the cal. Katol was the imperative masculine singular and it was also the infinitive construct. So you already know that the imperative masculine singular and infinitive construct are basically the same form. So it carries across here as well. How do you distinguish between the two? Context, number one. Number two, most infinitive constructs have a preposition attached to them. Most infinitive constructs have a preposition attached to them. Most often, the Lamed preposition. And so you would see a Lamed on here in most cases. That will help you to identify. And that's given for you on the bottom of page 128. Same form as the masculine singular imperative, but normally preceded by a preposition. And on the top of page 30, the uh, description of the infinitive absolute, a holum above the second root letter, the nifal triangle, or if it does not have a nifal triangle, a noon prefixed, and normally occurs with a finite verb meaning a perfect or imperfect form of the verb. And you have there the note regarding lachem, how it is normally taken as an active because it's found primarily in the nifal. Okay, any questions on nifal? Before we look at the exercise and go through it. We did not talk in detail about the various usages or the various meanings of the nifal. We will be doing that at a later date. All we're doing now is getting you to the point of being able to identify it and do basic translation. That's our purpose at this point. Later we'll come back to the nifal and we'll talk about its syntactical uh, and exegetical elements. We'll talk about the various meanings it can take. Uh, we'll talk about the various usages that it has so that you uh, have an idea of uh, how it uh, contributes to an interpretation of a passage in greater detail. All right, let's take our exercise number 20 then. Exercise number 20. All right, let's begin with number one. Number one. Uh, why don't we start uh, with you, George? Okay, translate number one for us. Um, because Eshvan, the city of uh, Sihon, king of the Amorites, then fought first with the king of Moab. All right. Now let's think about that a minute. We have a key at the beginning, which is probably because or for. Uh, you can generally use that in some context. You'll end up having to use if or when. But uh, here, for or because will work. Because Heshbon was or is the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites. Now let me explain a couple things about that first line. First of all, when we say because Heshbon was, where are we getting the concept of was? Notice there is no verb in the first line. Notice you have an athnak under the he that is in brackets. That is the logical midpoint of the verse. Therefore, the thought should be complete. 
You should not have to go on to the second line. And the second line, notice, begins with a wow. So it is an and there. So you want to make certain you translate the first line all by itself. The he is feminine singular. The he is feminine singular. Notice there's a note down there uh, on that uh, feminine singular. It says the actual form used in the Hebrew Bible is a he with a wow and an olive. Because in the Pentateuch, Moses spells the third feminine singular pronominal suffix uh, with a wow instead of a yod. So we change that for the purpose of your identifying it, since you're not that uh, locked into understanding Moses' variations in spellings of forms, and gave you the form that was so it wouldn't be confusing or you wouldn't think it was a transcriptional error on our part. The third feminine singular does not agree with Sihon because Sihon is king, not queen. So it has to agree with ear, which is city. The city is a feminine noun. When you look it up in the vocabulary, it's a feminine noun. So it, the he, refers to the city. So it's Heshbon, it, in essence, if you translate it literally, Heshbon, it, was the city of Sihon. Why the city of Sihon? Sihon, or Sihon here in the Hebrew, is a proper name. Therefore, it's definite. It's in construct with ear. Therefore, we translate the city of Sihon. The city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. Uh, questions? Yes, Jeff. Question about the I know we divide it there, but isn't there also a quarter marker on, on a Heshbon? Is that uh, there is a quarter marker on Heshbon, and there is a quarter marker on Ear. So do we, because Heshbon, can we just stop it there and then do what's from city to the uh, Athna? No, in this particular case you wouldn't. Here the Zakef Katon is uh, not as strong as it often is. And uh, so it really doesn't have that much bearing. The reason the Zakef Katon is there is Heshbon is behaving as a nominative absolute. So I shouldn't always try to rely on that. No, don't always rely on it. But it's good that you're paying attention to that and that you're attempting to deal with it. And so depending on what your translation is, you're not going to have any points to be, uh, dismissed because you have uh, uh, tried to reflect that. Okay. Use, just use it as a, t a chance to give you instruction on what to watch for. Part of the key for this is to see the uh, rabia over ear. The rabia over ear, that diamond over the top of the ayin, that is also a quarter marker. And what has happened here is that is not being used as a quarter marker either. It is being used as a topic marker. It's the focus of this first line. It's the city that is the focus. And Heshbon is the name of the city. And I think that because of the quarter marker being over ear as a topical marker, the Zakef Katon was brought into play because if there was not a Zakef Katon, the Rabia would be taken as a firm quarter marker, which would destroy the sentence. And so the Zakef Katon was placed in by the Masoretes uh, to back to back with the Rabia to give the signal that there should not be a major break here. In other words, they cancel each other out. It's like a double negative. And it leaves ear as still being the topic. All right? John. Um, the footnote in my workbook, number one, yes. it's in Greek. Uh, uh, that's because uh, they printed it off with a wrong file. They should have, and, and what happened probably is when they printed this off on the computer, whoever did it, uh, did not make certain they had all the fonts that were used first before they printed it. Well, that's what, I mean, yeah, I was I'm confused. sorry about that. I was confused that. anyways. Yeah, then. <laughs> right, yeah. What it should have there the first time in the Hebrew Bible is it should be this. And then the next time a normal defective spelling of should be this. Okay. It's one of the issues we have every time we get it printed because uh, Grace Books International just has the print shop print off these subsequent copies. Whereas originally, uh, when we had it done, uh, they did all the printing themselves, making certain they had the uh, right fonts, and then took it outside to be uh, copied or reproduced. 
but now they do all the copying reproducing inside and they've shortcutted it without realizing what's happened. We're trying to resolve that and uh, hopefully by next year we're going to have everything all revised anyway and uh, take care of it then. Which reminds me, I need to indicate a revision here for you anyway. Yes? Would you just give us the translation of that first right. section? The translation of the first line, because Heshbon was the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. And it's the king, again, because king of, it's in construct with ha emori, and ha emori not only has the definite article, but it is a proper noun to begin with. So it's uh, the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. The he is not really translated. Some talk about this as being a copula itself and taking the place of the form of the verb haya. Here it would be hayatha because ear is the subject. But uh, however that may be, the he is put there just to make certain that the city is the, understood as the topic. It's, it's doubly indicated by the revia over ear and by the he uh, pronoun at the end of that sentence. Okay? Anyone else? Other questions? Yes. Been a demonstrative pronoun. It would be demonstrative if it had the article and be that city. But remember, if it doesn't have the article, if it's a demonstrative pronoun, it has to be in a predicate adjective position. So you'd have to say, that is, to do that. And normally that would be first in the sentence if it's a predicate adjective. Okay? And here it's last. Okay, anything else there? All right, notice it agrees with the city, ear, in form, and uh, in gender and number. Uh, oh, yes, I want to make certain I gave you a uh, revision in your textbook on page 130, under 6D, infinitive absolute, where you have the C normally occur occurs with a finite verb, we have that further expanded to make it clearer. It now reads this way in our revision. Normally occur occurs with a finite, and then in parenthesis, perfect or imperfect, end of parenthesis, form of the verb. So after finite, we've inserted perfect or imperfect, to help the reader understand what is meant by finite. And then we've inserted form of the ahead of the word verb. So the last word is the same as already in the text there, period. So this was in the text, this was in the text. Everything from the parenthesis through the the is added to the text to just make it clearer. Because sometimes we say finite form of the verb, you're sitting there saying, what is meant by that? What is a finite form of the verb? And finite means it's either perfect or imperfect. It's perfect or imperfect. Okay? So we've tried to clarify that and make it clear. All right, let's uh, go to the second line then. In the second line, notice we have wahoo. There's the third masculine singular personal pronoun uh, connected with the wow conjunction. And he, here obviously a reference back to Sihon, the king, and he fought against the king of Moab. And then we have Harishon. And Harishon here is going to be an attributive adjective agreeing in gender, number, and definiteness with a noun it modifies. It means the first or the former king of Moab. Okay? And he, referring back to Sihon, fought. Here we have Nilham on your parsing sheet. That should be parsed as a nifal, perfect, third masculine singular from Lachem, meaning fight. Okay? And he fought against. The baith preposition is being translated as against. Baith following lachem 
almost always means against. Against, okay? Uh, and he fought against the king of Moab. Why the king of Moab? Because Moab is a proper noun. It's a proper noun. It's a name. Therefore, it's definite. And so, Melech will be considered definite. And that's why the adjective defining Melech has to have the article on it because of the definiteness. Okay, the former or the first, depending on context here, you could translate it either way at this point, the former or the first king of Moab. In context here, it's the former king of Moab, technically. But if you have first, no problem. Questions? Yes? So our very first defile verb is active? The very first defile verb you have is active. Exactly. Fits the note on page 130 in your textbook, <laughs> having to do with Lachem. Your reading, bill, uh, reading was put to the test immediately. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, one of the reasons we did that also is to keep before you the concept that the Hebrew language is extremely fluid and flexible. You have to very, be very cautious about being dogmatic about forms and meanings. You have to re depend upon context and usage. Context and usage. Scott? With Moab, would the article ever be included with that? Rarely. Rarely. Okay. Moab, Ammon, Israel, for example. I know of no case where Israel has the article. And the same with most place names, you normally don't have an article. You'll have an article with like Amorites, where you have what is called the Gentilic noun. When we talk about Gentilic, that is derived from the noun Gentile, Gentile, which means the nations, that means outside Israel. So Gentilic noun is a national noun, an ethnic noun. So Emori is uh, Amorite, since that's a Gentilic noun. And in the lexicons, it'll just be abbreviated. It'll be abbreviated G-E-N-T. And that's not talking about a gentleman. It's not gents. It's the idea of Gentilic. And it tells you it's a national name or an ethnic group name as the word. Okay, any other questions on number one? None? Okay. Let's go then to uh, number, uh, <laughs> in mine it says number three. Does it say number three in yours? It does? That is interesting. We try to get all these things out. And it, it's so amazing. We remove one error and then we, we get it printed out and we find out it caused another error. And uh, just, is, just goes on and on. Reminds us of the uh, book that was published in France on French grammar back in the 1800s. Uh, it had undergone 150 to 200 years of proofreading and revising because the French are very, very particular. And this was to be the national showcase grammar of French. So it could not have any errors in it. And so they refused to publish it until it was free of errors. And when it was published, immediately several professors of French at the Sorbonne pointed out that it had over 100 errors in it. That's what happens. We're just human beings. It happens over and over. I just pray that we can keep it down to 100 <laughs> when it's finally put in final form in, in the fall. Okay, a question. Yes, um, James. Number, number one with how we shown. Yes. Are we supposed to, um, is there supposed to know whether it's first or former? Context alone. And here context would indicate former, but for you, without a context, either translation will do. It will be accepted as correct. Okay? All right. The second one then. Uh, let's go from here and uh, why don't we take Kempis. Kempis, why don't you translate the second sentence there. Uh, and the earth was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Okay. Now here again. Unless you look down at the bottom there, footnote number seven, see it's Genesis 6, 11, 
and it clicks with you that that's in the pre-flood era and therefore it's in that passage that talks about the sons of God and the daughters of men and gives the cause of the flood, you might have translated Haaretz as the land. So if you did translate as the land, don't count it as incorrect, but it should be the earth by context uh, and the earth. Uh, and here we notice you have a, a wayik tol form of the verb. You have a wow with a pathic under it. A dogish in the prefix letter of the imperfect, the tau there, and that'd be a doubling dogish. As a wayik tol, this then should be translated normally with a then or a so or a therefore or a thus, something of that nature. Now, if you just have and in there today, don't mark it wrong, but circle it. Circle it. Because we have to get you into the habit of not using and if you have a wayik toll. Because the primary sense of a wayik toll is what in one word? Sequence, sequence, and sequence is not necessarily exhibited by the simple conjunction and. That only shows that it's connected in some way. What you want to do is get either logical sequence or chronological sequence. Logical sequence, so, therefore, thus. Temporal sequence or chronological sequence, then. So get into the habit of using one of those translations. Of course, context will tell you which one. But I want you to get in the habit now of starting to translate that way even when you don't have a context so that you can see what it should be. All right? Try to remember that on Wayik Tol. Because in the third semester of Hebrew, if you don't translate the Wayik Tol with one of those particles that shows sequence, you will be losing points on your translation. So use this semester to get used to the idea that and is not the best translation in the vast majority of cases for a wayik told verb. Okay? Just circle it for now if and is there. Then the earth was corrupt. Was corrupted could be translated. Remember it's a passive idea here normally. Uh, it is a stative to be corrupt, and uh, so some have suggested that as a stative, uh, the passive is really inoperative uh, because you don't have an action, and uh, so they would just say was corrupt. So was corrupt or was corrupted, both will be acceptable on your translation. Both are accepted. Any other translations of that first verb that we need to discuss or ask about? Yes, James? Became corrupt is fine. Yes, I'll talk about that uh, when we start on chapter 21. I'll bring something up about that. Okay, that's fine. It might even be best, actually. Okay? So, Scott, that's very perceptive of you. All right, anyone else? Or lucky, right? <laughs> All right. All right, so we go on. The, the earth was corrupt or was corrupted. Lifne literally is to the faces of. To the faces of. But that lifne is used repeatedly in the Old Testament just to mean in front of or before. So it's before God or in front of God. In front of God sounds kind of uh, awkward here. It's as though he was materially present and it's, he's right there. But if you say before God, then it, it works better. Uh, another translation that's possible is in the presence of God or in God's presence. Notice art, also here the article on Elohim is not translated. It's not the God. That makes it sound like he's only one of many. So it's an article that is not normally translated. Same with hotheos in the Greek New Testament. The article is not normally translated. So we don't translate the article here either. Scott? but not on other proper nouns, like Moab and It's confusing. It seems like on any word you wouldn't put it on, it would be Elohim. Same as in that, with Theos in the Greek New Testament. It's just uh, seeing it's proper for that. And, it's, and actually, you see, it's not the only noun that's that way, proper noun. There are many proper nouns. About 50% of all proper nouns will take the article, and about 50% won't. So there's really no rhyme or reason. No. 
No, it's just usage. That's the way it was. That's the way they used it. That was their preference. So we just have to get used to it. <laughs> All right? And then we have uh, the next one I would translate as thus or therefore because it's the logical consequence of the first. The earth was corrupted or was corrupt before God, therefore, or thus, as a consequence, the earth was filled with violence. The corruption breeds violence. Okay? That's the reason we have a sequential here. The wayik toll, that second verb is also wayik toll, needs to be taken into account. It's talking about a sequence. Therefore, the sequence affects how we look at this verse, how we look at this passage, how we preach this text. If we just say, well, it is corrupted, and it's corrupted because it's filled with violence, we're not preaching the text for what it says. We're imposing upon it our concept. Because the text, by the use of the white toll, says it is sequential. The first is first, and the second is second. Therefore, you have a logical consequence. Consequence with sequence. It is the result that comes after. Okay? So, so or therefore, uh, the earth was filled with violence. The violence is that which is produced by, instigated by, or is encouraged by the corruption that is present. Now, there's, if you can't preach that, I don't know how, how, what you're going to do when you stand in the pulpit. Because it's the corruption of mankind that leads to the multiplied sins of mankind. It's because of our sin nature that we sin. You see? It's because of what we are by character that we do what we do. And violence is because of the nature of man being corrupted. And that's exactly what this verse is showing by this sequence of the Wayuk Tol. The grammar supports this strongly. And of course you find confirmation throughout the Old and New Testaments of that propositional truth. But uh, too often men approach this text and look at it only in the English where and is what is used and they just assume that they're co-equal statements and parallel to one another. But when you look in the Hebrew you see a wayik toll and that wayik toll tells you there's a sequence here. That's why I emphasize so strongly that you learn that Wayik Toll has its primary focus sequence. Okay? It is something that is exegetically significant and is also expositionally significant in a text like this. To preach it any other way is to preach it wrongly. Okay? Sorry to get to preaching, but that's exactly why you're learning Hebrew, isn't it? You're learning Hebrew in order to preach. And I get excited by it. When I see the text in the Hebrew and I see what it brings out and what it contributes to our knowledge of the text and how it helps us to avoid error, we're prone to so many errors anyway, we can use every single little help we can get. And the Hebrew provides us with an abundance of help if we'll only use it and look at it consistently. And this is a place where too often, I've heard sermons on Genesis 6 that just curl my hair. I guess it's gone now, but <laughs> maybe it just caused it to disappear. I pulled it out. But, uh, it, it <laughs> but it's, it's really amazing to me. And, and it's just the beauty of it. And of course, both of these verbs would be on your parsing sheet. And both of them will be identified as being wayik tol, or in your parsing sheet, it's wow consecutive. Wow consecutive, because it has the prefix wow consecutive over in the left hand column there. And it, both of these are nifal. Both of them are imperfect. Notice the tau prefix. And plus it's wayik tol. Wayik tol is only imperfect, it's not found anywhere else. And both are third feminine singular. Third feminine singular. Now the form is identical to second masculine singular. And if you're still marking all possibilities, that would be marked too. If you did not mark it, no problem. Because starting this semester, I want you to look at the context that you're parsing. And here the subject is ha'aretz. And eretz as a noun is a feminine noun. So that tells you that the verbs here are third feminine singular. Question? Yeah, I didn't completely 
we uh, remember we talk about the bio consistent here in the question sheets, and I have all because of the vowel there, I put the conjunction. Okay. Um, that's right. It'll, it'll be wrong, wrong, but fortunately, there are so many points here, it'll only lose you about a fourth of a percent <laughs> if you did it wrong. Okay? But remember, it is while consecutive. Remember, that's the, the uh, topic of this chapter, chapter 20. The topic is while consecutive. So uh, make certain that you have that marked there. Okay? Any questions on the translation of number two here? Yes, James. Do we normally translate the Nephel, or that's where it was corrupt, or? Yes. Full? Normal translation uses a form of the verb to be either to, to demonstrate the passive voice or to demonstrate the stative. And both of those are possible here because your fill is a stative verb. Okay? Yes, Scott. It brings up a question on the parsing sheet. Then should, or it doesn't matter if we put full or was full regarding the uh, meaning. No, because on meaning, all you're putting is one word. So it shouldn't be was. Full. You shouldn't have was on any of your parsing sheets. Try to get it to where on the meaning in that far right hand column, you put one word fight, fill. In other words, use the basic, simplest form of the verb, right. just the verb. Correct. Right. No. Just, just use the present tense. Fight, fight, say, tell, uh, create, uh, do, fill, uh, corrupt, etc. Just one word. Don't try to put he something. Don't try to put it in past tense. Just put the simplest basic English form of the present of that verb in one word. One word. A tone, cover, etc. Okay? All right, number three, number three, and let's, uh, Jeff, why don't you take that one and translate for us, please. That's a good tough one. And you take for yourself. That's why I chose you. <laughs> <laughs> and you take for yourself from all food which he will eat, and you gather for yourself, and it will become food for you and for them. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Except for one word. Who caught it? What is the one Hebrew word that was not translated accurately? He will eat. He will eat would be an active, would be a cow. Take a look at the verb though. It's ye akel. Ye akel. Notice you have the nifal triangle because you have a comets under the olive. The olive rejects the doubling doggish that's part of the nifal triangle, so in compensation, the hirik before it is heightened to a tseri. This is a nifal, imperfect, first common uh, singular, or third, excuse me, third, third masculine singular. Uh, got carried off by the first common singular because of the olive. It's, the olive is part of the root, not the prefix. So it's a nifal imperfect third masculine singular from akal, eat. Okay? So the nifal would be passive. So it can be eaten, or it might be eaten, or it may be eaten. So the it is referring to the food. And you, and here you is emphatic, because you is understood with the imperative kach, take. So you could have translated this, and as for you, and as for you, or even but as for you, because you have a wow here on a non-verb. So either translation will be correct. And as for you, or but as for you, take for yourself from all the food which might be eaten, or which could be eaten, or which can be eaten. Okay? It's the food which is eaten. Okay? And you shall gather unto yourself. In other words, here you have supply the object because it's not given. You shall gather it for yourself. And you shall gather it for yourself or gather it to unto yourself, to yourself, unto yourself. All those will be acceptable. And it will be, the it again is the food, the mat ekal, and it will be for you and for them for food, literally, or smoother translation, as food. 
Here we have akla, and it can be translated as for food or for eating. Either way will fit. All right, any questions on number three? Yes. And as for you, or but as for you, or just if you have you, take for yourself from all the food. That could also be translated as some of all the food, because the min is the idea of uh, uh, separating out something. So it could be some of, or it can be from all the food, which might be eaten, could be eaten, showing the passive of the nifal, and Ma'akal is the subject. And you shall gather, or you must gather, or you can even translate this as an imperative, because a perfect second masculine singular following an imperative like kach can be also taken in as an imperative. You find that with Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Uh, listen, hear, O Israel, and love the Lord your God. That love is actually a cal perfect second masculine singular. And so by context, it is taken as imperatival. And here you can do the same thing and gather unto yourself or to yourself or for yourself. And if you supplied the object, it would be it. Gather it for yourself. And it shall be, it because it's the food, it shall be for you and for them for eating or for food. Either one of those. Or as food. So there's quite a variety of possible translations there. I'm going to just uh, stop here. Rather than going through the remainder, I'll be looking at these and marking them. How, how many of you uh, thoroughly enjoyed the little puzzle? <laughs> Did, how many of you filled out every blank? Wow, great, fantastic. Uh, there's actually enough there that you can fill out double that number of blanks. There are a lot of words available. And on the review, I trust you did well on the review because the review deals with things that are very significant for your Hebrew learning. Bagad kafath letters are what take that doggish lane, the weak doggish, which is hardening, hardening doggish. The full letter vowels, the holomwal, the shurik, the, the tsereyod, the hirik yod, and the comets hay. The composite schwa goes with gutturals especially Aleph, Hay, Chaith, and Ayin. And the letters that take the strong doggish, Forte, the doubling doggish, are the gutturals, Aleph, Hay, Chaith, Ayin, and sometimes Resh. And the fifth, what is the fun function of the Athnak? It's to mark the logical midpoint of the verse. The logical midpoint of the verse. Okay, do I have all exercise number 20? Okay, and do you have exercise 21 open there? It's on the PL and Pu'al conjugations, and so you have three translations that uh, you are to go through. There are no new words in number one and no new words in number uh, two. There are three new words in number three that you'll have to discover. And those three new words are listed for you on the bottom of the page there and over the top of the next page. And what I've done is try to walk you through Holiday's Lexicon. If you do not have Holiday's Lexicon yet, uh, use one in the library, borrow one, do something. You should have one. It's a required textbook. But uh, use it. Follow the instructions. Go to page 338 and go to page 337. Do the things I've told you to do there with regard to that A on May Rahok. And then on Nigash takes you to page 227 and read through all that I've given you there and see on Ha Erafel uh, you'll be going to page 284 column 1 for the correct entry and there are three new words in translation number 4 and again I've walked you through but here I'm allowing you to do some of the work and so I've said remember that Hebrew lexicons are arranged alphabetically how early in the Hebrew alphabet is the Gimel very early. What letter is it? First, second, third, fourth, fifth? Third. 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 Aleph, Beth, Gimel. So it's the third letter. So as you turn the lexicon, you look under that, and then the next letter is a Beth. Which letter is that? The second. So that's going to be early. So it's going to be early in the Gimel section that you're going to find the root Gaver. All right? And so I want you to write in the page number 
on which you found that. Find the first entry that begins with the Gimel. It is found on page what? That's the first entry with Gimel. Not Gavar, but the first entry with Gimel. Where do the Gimels begin? Put the page, put the page number on. And then look at the second root letter, the Baith, and find the first entry in holiday that begins with a Gimel Baith. Gimel Baith. You're still not to Gavar, so it's still not the page number that you'll ultimately end up on. Put that page number where the first Gimel Baith is found. And then Resh comes early or late in the alphabet. Late. So you're going to have to watch those Gimel Baiths till you come down to the Resh. And when you find Gavar, put the page number for that. And then the question is, in how many different stems or conjugations is this Hebrew word found in the Old Testament? In holiday, there's a separate paragraph that is headed in bold with an abbreviation for those conjugations. It will tell you Cal, it will tell you Nifal, usually N-I-F period, or P-L or Pu-L, or Hifil, H-I-F period, or Hafal, H-O-F period, or Hifpael, which is H-I-T-H period. So look at the paragraphs that give the names and then write down here how many different stems or conjugations this Hebrew word found in the Old Testament. Okay? It can't occur in any more than those that we have. Cal, Nifal, Hifil, Hafal, Pel, Pu'al, Hifpael. There are only seven conjugations. So it can't occur in more than seven. And very few words occur in all seven. Very few words occur in all seven. So look to see how many. There will be a paragraph for each one. And then peruse the forms presented in the first few lines of each paragraph. Those are the forms that are found in the Hebrew Bible. And you'll probably find this very form there. Gavru. Somewhere in one of those. And that will help to confirm that you've rightly parsed it. Okay. You'll find it there. Notice the firms are listed with the perfects, PF period. First, then it goes to the imperfects, and then it goes to participles and infinitives and, and others, imperatives. Can you find the exact same form that is used in Genesis 7.19? And when, there's, when it, they cite that exact form or that exact reference, you'll see GN 7.19. And if you find that, that tells you the very passage you're working with, the meaning is given for you. At least the lexicographer's interpretation of that meaning is given. Are any of the scripture references closely related to this passage? You may not find 719, but you might find 718 or 720, which is the same context and probably the same meaning or usage. So those are all keys in looking at it. Uh, on uh, B, you can go through it. Just follow the, uh, the way that I've directed you through the lexicon entry and do that all the way through. And then the last page has a review. Which letters of the alphabet sometimes lose their consonantal character and become silent? Which letters are gutturals? What types of gutturals? Uh, what are the two types of gutturals called? And which gutturals belong in each group? That goes way back to some of the first lessons for your review. And labials and the weak doggish laney, what's its function? And then circle the letter or vowel which does not belong in a group. It's kind of like Sesame Street. Which of these do not belong? Which of these is not like the others? And circle those. And then give the stem or conjugation and form of the following keys. And uh, hopefully the vowels are better placed in your copies than they are in mine. If they're not, it might provide a difficulty. For example, number two, uh, the doggish should be in the second or middle box. The doggish should be in the middle box, not between the two boxes. And the tseri should be under the second box. Do you have it that way or is it in between those two boxes? Between? No, you got yours in the box? Okay, good, good, good. Mine isn't. But mine may be because I printed off on the printer that we have in the office which doesn't conform to this Hebrew font. So, but anyway, follow that through. And just use the keys there, the, the clues. Because you can identify these verbs this way with just that much. You don't have to know the root radicals. So see how you do on that. And we'll come back and discuss it.
Okay? Yes, Scott. Is there some places where you ask questions because only the place for us to fill in the answer? Are you just doing that for our own benefit or do you want us to write the answers out? I don't know if it's paper, like what does the vow indicate the answer to the question? No, if, if there's no blank to fill in when you're going through the lexicon exercise, those are just, you give your own answer to yourself. If you want to write it in in your exercise sheet for your own benefit, fine, but it's not required. Just fill the blanks. Okay? Anyone else? Okay, let's turn to chapter 21 in your textbook, page 131, the PL and PUAL conjugations. First of all, let's look at the exegetical insights, Genesis 1, 2. I'll read it in Hebrew, word by word, you repeat after me, okay? Weha'aretz. Weha'aretz. Hayatha. Tohu. Wavohu. Wehoshek. Alpanei. Tehom. Weruach. Elohim. Merachefeth. Alpanei. Hamayim. Okay, now let's try reading a little bit more. I'll go all the way to the Zakef Katon over Wavohu. And you repeat after me after I've read it. Wehaaretz Hayata Tohu Wavohu. And then the rest of that line, Wehoshek Al Pene Tehom. And then to the Zakef Katon, which is just two words here, Weruach Elohim. And then through to the end, Merachefeth al Pnei Hamayim. Okay, some of you get a little bit weak the further we go, but keep working on it. Get to where you can read these. Uh, I would even recommend, if you have the time to do so, that some of these you even begin to memorize at least parts of. Uh, the very first part of this is very easy. It's got a rhyme to it almost, a, a rhythm to it, and it's very significant. And that's Weha'aretz Hayatha Tohu Wavohu. If you just memorize that much, you have a part of the scripture that is significant and important, and uh, you'll be ahead on that. Uh, it's, it's good to try to memorize. Now, the Hayatha there should not be translated became. You'll see some translations do that. You'll see some commentaries do that because they want to push the idea of a chaos theory or they want to push the idea of a gap theory. But the Hebrew is the perfect of Hayah, not the imperfect of Hayah. In fact, we know this because, for example, the Jews who translated the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament 250 years before Christ, translated this verb with a form of a me as opposed to a form of genomai. A me in the Greek is I am. Genomai in the Greek is I become. There's a distinctness here. And in the Septuagint translation of Genesis 1, every time we have a perfect of Hayah, a form of a me is used. Every time we have an imperfect of Hayah, a form of genomai is used. And so it's very consistent. And on top of that, 650 years later, when Jerome learns Hebrew from a rabbi in Bethlehem and begins to translate the Latin Vulgate, he observes the exact same distinction in his Latin translation. It's only us later English translators and speakers that make the mistake of not observing here the distinction between a perfect of a stative verb and an imperfect of a stative verb. So in that paragraph there, let me give you, we have some... Uh, some additions here to give you to help get you used to the terminology that will be used later. What I have here, if you look at the middle of that first line under Hayatha, Haya is a stative verb, parenthesis, a verb of being as opposed to doing. Stative verbs consistently define a state of being or existence. Insert before the by there, insert a parenthesis equals 
static stative. Let me put that on the board up here. So right after state of being or existence in bold, then insert equal static stative in the parenthesis before the word by that's there. So static stative verbs consistently define a state of being or existence, parenthesis equals static stative in the parenthesis by means of the perfect, which is the same thing as saying the katal form, and a state of being or happening, and after that bold, you put equal dynamic stative, and it is also followed by the word by. So you're inserting both of these parentheses right after each bold statement. And a state of becoming or happening, parenthesis, equals dynamic stative, end of parenthesis, by means of the imperfect. And the difference there, the dynamic stative has become, the static stative is be, or am, was, is, will be. Okay? That's the distinction. So in this case, the earth was. It's a state of being. It says nothing about becoming. You cannot support the chaos theory. You cannot support the gap theory by the Hebrew grammar. You cannot translate it became. It'd be totally inconsistent. And the evidence is not only within the Hebrew grammar itself. It is supported by the ancient versions and how the Jews and Jerome understood the Hebrew themselves. And then the second paragraph, Wechoshek al the home, as you read that, notice that al panay is an idiom. Don't translate it as upon the faces of. Just translate it on the surface of. Al panay here just means surface. It's the Hebrew way of saying surface, is faces of. And that still comes across in our English when our word surface, sir, face. And then uh, the reason for taking to home as a definite noun and translating it as the deep is because it is unique in that setting. And so we add the definite article to it in English even though there is no article in the Hebrew. And that fits the Hebrew grammar that in a context normally the first time a noun is utilized in a unique sense it does not use the article, and then in subsequent occurrences, it will use the article. We have the same thing here with Choshek. Choshek does not have the article. It's unique. There's only darkness. There is no light. Uh, it is all darkness. There is no other darkness. There are, no, there are different, not different kinds of darkness or different levels or degrees of darkness. But subsequent to this, in later verses, it's ha Choshek with the article. And there it's article of previous reference, that darkness, that previously mentioned darkness. And then the next line, Weruach Elohim merachefeth al hamayim, has a participle, merachefeth, it's a PL participle, feminine singular. Notice the F ending, it's the alternate form. We know that it is a PL because it has a schwa under the prefix mame, and it has a pathic under the first root letter. That tells us it is a PL. Why doesn't have a doubling doggish in the second root letter? It's a guttural, the chayth. It rejects the doubling. Okay? It, it will not always change it. Okay? And notice that the participle agrees with its subject in number and gender. Its subject is ruach. Ruach is a singular feminine noun, spirit, okay? So the participle is singular and feminine. All right, go on over to page 132. Page 132, the first paragraph, we're making changes here as well. It reads this way now. The P-L and Pu-L stems represent the fact forms of the Hebrew verb. Okay, so change intensive to factative. Okay. 
The PL and Pu'al stems represent the fact that he forms the Hebrew verb. Then cross out to designate this intensity. Put a line through to designate this intensity. Change the T on these to a capital T. These two conjugations characteristically duplicate the second root letter by placing a strong doggish forte in it. Second paragraph. It must be noted that delete however and the commas before and after. It just should read, it must be noted that the traditional characterization of these stems as intensive is misleading instead of could be. Is misleading instead of could be. The rest of it all remains the same. Now, let me explain this. When we talk about the PL and PUAL being factative, we're talking about it being a form of causative. But there are two types of causation. One causation is to cause something to occur or to cause someone to do something. So to cause someone to do is one thing. Causing someone to be is another thing. The causing someone or something to do is the hifil and hafal. The causing someone or something to be is the pl and pu'al. And to some degree, even the hithpa'el. This is the distinction. The hifil and hafal have to do with the causation of doing something. The pl and pu'al and sometimes hithpa'el have to do with the causing of something or someone to be something. For example, if we take the verb root kadash, the kof, daleth, and sheen, kadash. If you look that up in your lexicon, it gives the meaning be holy. Be holy. When the be is put here, that tells you it is a stative verb. Like to be full, be small, be great, uh, be able, be honored, be heavy, be light, etc. Those are all stative verbs because you have to use a form of the verb be in their translation. So if you look at the cow and you find in the cow that the verb is stative. In the lexicon you have a be with it. Then that means when the same root occurs in the peel and pu'al and also often in the hithpa'el, it is thereby a factative. And it means then, if you put this into the PL, the PL kidesh means he will bring into, and the object, whatever the object is, he will bring something or someone into the state of being holy. In other words, he causes that object or person to be holy. In English, we translate that with the verb sanctify. Sanctify is a causative verb form in English. That if I ending, classify, to place in classes, uh, to sanctify, to mortify, to kill, <laughs> to uh, cause someone to be stunned. Uh, the IFY ending is a causative ending. And it's causing a state. It's a factative as a causative. Okay, it's factative. And if you do the same thing in Greek, in Greek, such verbs normally end in idzo. Okay? So if you have the verb for holy, it's hagiadzo. Right? 
to sanctify, he sanctified, I sanctify, hagiadzo. So anytime you have that, katharidzo, he cleansed, he caused to be clean, you see, katharidzo, he purified. Notice the English, purify, cause to be pure, made pure, cause to enter a state or condition of being pure, purify. So in the Hebrew, the ify in the English, the idzo or adzo in the Greek is represented by the pl and pu'al in Hebrew. Okay? Questions? Do you understand that at this point? We'll be repeating this over and over. But that's exactly what is involved here. Yes? Should we no longer think of the pl and pu'al as intensive at all? You should not think of it as intensive at all. The only time it will ever be intensive, even it's in a distinct minority of cases, is when it is called what, what we call an iterative use. Iterative means repeated, repetitive. When something is done again and again or repeatedly or whatever, the peel or pu'al can be used for that, but it's a minority usage. And that's the closest to the concept of intensive that really exists with the peel and pu'al. So don't use translations like utterly. He will utterly destroy them because it's avad in the peel. Uh, no, it's the idea of he will bring them into a, a state of destruction. It's the idea of he will destroy them. But the real concept is he will bring them into a state of destruction. It's not utterly destroy. The utterly, if you're going to have it, has to be by means of an adverb or adverbial phrase to bring that out, but not by means of the PL or PUA. Okay? Yes, Kelly. Um, I'm curious with the little phrases, cause someone to do, cause someone to be, is there a phrase like that that can classify the cow and the nithel? Uh, not normally. There are, some, there are a few cases. Uh, where the nifal is used in a causative sense. Um, one of those, I believe, is in Daniel chapter 12, somewhere between verse 1 and verse 3, uh, where you have, try and think of the word that is used. Uh, it's in the nifal, and it definitely, by context, has a causative sense. Uh, you have the cal of uh, Kadesh used in uh, Psalm 19, verse uh, 7 where it has a where it says uh, they sanctify completely it's not they are completely or altogether holy uh, it's or excuse me it's tzadak not kadash tzadak they are not completely or wholly righteous referring to the judgments of God or Yahweh but it's rather they make completely uh, righteous they, they, they justify they justify so uh, there are some cases where you can have a causative use of the cal or nifal, but they're rare and they're not uh, the normal usage. And again, they're determined by context and by the semantic domain of the root itself. Some roots, some meanings are just inherently causative, no matter what stem they're in. The same as there's some roots that are inherently repetitive, no matter what stem they're in.